So next up is um, is Ian Muir. Um, Ian's been around a while, <laughs> and he's got That's the it. best glasses next That's to it. mine. Um, <laughs> so Ian's been involved in banking. He's been involved in robotics, industrial automation. Um, he's uh, currently a professor at the Faculty of Design, um, Architecture and Building at the University of Technology in Sydney. Um, he's the managing director of IDM Design Labs. Mm -hmm. He's a non-executive board director at the leading startup space, Fishburners. He's also um, um, a very close friend of ICA Sydney. And um, he will also be hanging around tonight to do some talking and is probably one of the people who will be there when it's closed. <laughs> because Ian does like to talk, he does like to share, and he very much likes to be generous uh, with the community of which he is going to do for us right now. Everyone welcome Ian Muir. Thanks, Joe. Thanks very much. So, um, wow, this is, this is great. Uh, great talk, Tim. I think that's such a good lead-in and a great compliment to, uh, to what I'm talking about here tonight. I'm actually going to share with you uh, what I've coined as the 5i design leadership model. And um, let me just start by saying design and, well, in fact, leadership has been studied for decades. And there's thousands of books on it and papers that have been written about it. And yet, in all of that, we've not evolved to a single common definition of what great leadership is or any distinct formula that is the perfect leadership uh, set of rules. So leadership's complex. Tim referred to people are complex, right? Um, context changes and, and things evolve, part of which I'll talk about tonight. So there's no perfect leader. No perfect leader personality. We, we used to, in the research, say it's about traits. We've dis, uh, dis, um, gone, moved on from that and, and now realised that it's actually not about traits. So all sorts of people can be leaders, and I think Tim has uh, framed that beautifully tonight. You don't have to be brash and bold to be a good leader. Uh, but look, with all of this information, it can be really difficult to navigate that and then sort of filter that as to what's relevant. And that's part of why... I've created this, um, this idea of the model and the talk because um, this is a culmination, I guess, of my own experience, but then talking to um, uh, leaders from around the world, uh, being involved in writing curriculum in design leadership, uh, and, and it's not that I've done those wonderful things. It's actually there's common patterns that have come up out of that from me, and so what I've actually created in this is something that actually can be used as a self-mentoring tool so these are five things that I feel are important to know about from a design perspective as a leader. And so um, with that, you can use this tool for sense making of your own, for sense checking. So if things aren't quite feeling right as a leader and you're not quite sure why, come back and look at the tool and go, what are the aspects or avenues I might need to have a look in? Uh, but also in sharing this, I'm hoping to share um, you know, through some of those com common patterns and s some of the common experiences that people have talked to me about, um, some of the things that might help you find some clues as to where these answers are. I, I get so much people go, yeah, but how do we get cut through? And so I'm hoping that some of uh, the information is, is what that's all about and how we provide that. <clears throat> So I'll often um, be referring to design leader. It does refer to leadership as well, generally. And equally, it applies to those that aren't in the leadership role. So it's not just about the leader. This is actually about a team, a team of people. And how do you become a high-performing team and get that cut through? So um, don't feel excluded if I, if I keep referring to the design leader. Um, these, these five topics, I could spend at least a day on each of them, right? So I'm trying to condense that down into about 30 minutes, and we'll see how that goes. Um, it's kind of like a precarious high wire act here. I'm going to deliver a lot of concepts in a short space of time. Let's hope uh, we don't fall off and I, and I lose you along the way. So um, the, the first of the five eyes is instrumental, and I'm going to concentrate on this one tonight because it's one of these sort of foundational pieces. It's primarily about leadership strategy and developing key understandings that impact a lot of the other eyes. 
and are directly related to getting cut through and getting that high-performance team going. The next is instructional, and there's two aspects to instructional. So you can think about that as, you know, as a leader, you, you're either more experienced or have different experiences, and people are expecting to learn from that. They want to learn from that. And so there's this natural expectation that you're going to be in a role, whether you like it or not, as an educator, as an instructor. So it's, it's worthwhile paying attention to that and acknowledging that. And then just do a little bit of learn how to be an educator without talking down to your people or going, oh, well, I'm more experienced to you. So there's some ways that you can think about that that will actually help impart that knowledge so that you can all learn from that. And there's a couple of examples that I've got where I learn so much from my team. That's, that's the beauty of having such a great team and so many wonderful people in the team. You're actually equally learning from them as a leader. Um, the other aspect of instructional is you sometimes have to issue instructions you know, or set direction. And you have to be careful in the way that you do that. So there's a couple of things here that I'd like to share in terms of how you can do that in a way that's from a leadership viewpoint, not from a managerial perspective, and provide you with a tool that might un help overcome some of those pitfalls. Um, so inspirational is one of those words that's quite often associated with, oh, leaders, they're inspiring. Tim talked about this, right? And I think the thing is, it can be surprising. The design leaders need to think strategically about inspiration and apply process and structure and discipline to creating a culture of inspiration. It almost sounds at odds with itself, but it's actually really important to embed that as a part of the team. <coughs> um, you know, the, the, um, the thing is, inspiration fuels creativity. And so that's why it's so essential in a design team. And the design leader also has to protect the team, ensuring that others don't see these activities as being optional or fun. Right? It's a key part of what we do as designers. <coughs> um, so, so I think that's, uh, that's a really important aspect of, of maintaining that culture. And, and as the team scales, that actually gets more difficult to retain the integrity of the process and the culture of inspiration. So you have to work at that. Um, when it comes to influence, as a design leader, or even as a leader, you, you'll be consciously influencing people, but also unconsciously. People are watching you all the time, and they're replicating things that you do. And so you have to be very aware of that. What's the impact you're having on your team and others around you that are things that they're picking up cues that you're not even aware of that you're passing on. And so in the model, I look at um, how to think more strategically about who you influence and aware, be aware of who you might unconsciously be influencing. And also, how you can be creative about that influencing and think creatively about it's not just about managing up all the time. Influence is strongly connected to instrumental, which is, as we delve into that, you'll see part of what I mean about that. And so um, thinking about being an instrument of change leads to communicating that to other stakeholders, which is why you actually have to connect it to that influence. And then the last of the five eyes is impact, the culmination of some of the, um, the, the other four eyes but also looking beyond just the team and the impact that you have beyond the organisation as well. Um, particularly these days, looking to uh, you know, how it impacts the way the world works, or in fact, how we want the world to work. So let me delve into a couple of these in a bit more depth. Um, firstly, with instrumental, there's three key themes that I wanted to cover here under instrumental, right? So what's the purpose of the design capability that you're leading? And how do you look to sort of grow and scale that capability? And then understand some of the contextual limits that you'll find you're sitting within. And this is where some of these points of resistance come through, so it's really important that by understanding them, you can actually start to get cut through and share, share that information with others. So a really important question here, right? Do you matter? 
right? And I'm not talking about you as an individual, you as a leader, or you as a team member. Whether you're a designer or not, you might be peripherally involved in that team. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the capability itself. How does it add value and who cares? It's a really important question. Um, one of the ways I used to pose this to, to my team was, imagine we merged with another organisation and the mergers and acquisition team were then assessing what to keep and what to shed. And we really wanted to be in a position where they would be going, that team, they really add value to this organisation, you have to retain them. So that was how we used to think about it. Um, this is John. And John is the CEO of a small business on the Gold Coast that manufactures pontoons and jetties. And he was involved in a Queensland government initiative to use design thinking to enhance the economic value of small business in Queensland. And as a part of that, there was a very experienced design professor came to work with John, and one of the very first things he did is asked him, do you really understand the business that you're in? And do you understand your customers? And John, well, John conveyed to me what he felt about those questions. And I've also talked to the design professor that was on the other side of that response. And I think I'm paraphrasing here, but this is pretty much what his response was. <laughs> right? Now, John was a hardcore mining engineer and as an experienced CEO. And he's going, no way. Who the hell do you think you are asking me stupid questions like that? It took him a couple of weeks to settle down enough that he could even meet with the professor again. Right? So, you know, and this is the thing. It can be a really confronting question. And it can be one of those that's like, oh, don't be so stupid. I know what we're doing. Right? You're embedded in a team. You're in an organisation. We've been doing it for years. What do you mean do I know what, I, what we do, where we add value? You actually have to face into that question and keep asking that question. Would the M&A team actually keep you? Would they actually advocate for keeping you? Um, John's company went on to create some really amazing award-winning designs, and actually, I think it was between five and ten times the uplift in revenue by tapping into global markets that had never been before. John was pretty impressed with the whole process. And this, this is not you know, a design thinking story. This is actually a, do you really understand the business that you're in, right? Startups. Zingers or whoever they might be, right? They're really focused on, we know our proposition and we are going to execute that better than anyone else. And that is really knowing what you're about and what you do. So it can be confronting and it can be really easy to be complacent. And so you can expect resistance from your team. You can expect resistance from colleagues or colleagues going, really? You're going to spend time at an offsite and spend money doing what? You don't even know what business you're in. Don't, don't be afraid to, to stare down at that. Um, so here's a, let's say, a product development cycle or a change management uh, program of work, uh, you know, runs end to end from strategy down to run and maintain. Now, as a design capability, it's very unlikely that you can span that entire bridge there. Right? So you have to make choices about where you're going to operate. You know, the, 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 the strategy definition, where to play, how to win. How's that going to work for you? And we did this exercise at one stage, and this was pretty much what we came up with, is what was going on and where we were operating. Now, the thing was, what was interesting is this to told us a lot about what was going on, because this is how we were feeling. It's like never enough resources, we're always on the back foot, we're involved in all this work right at the tail end of things. It's like, oh, my God, but we could add much more value. We, we, you know, we're really... Um, Feeling pretty exhausted, actually. And so the next step was then to, to make decisions. It's like, OK, well, where do we want to play? And you know, in, this was in Westpac, right? So in the Westpac group, there's no way that we we're going to be able to take over the entire strategy program. But you know what? We could play a lot better role in that. And we made conscious decisions about that. We actually engaged stakeholders and put processes in place to then make that happen. Same with the, the reactive. Um, ad hoc work, or as I like to call it a lot of the time, post hoc. So, hey, if we've done this design and apparently you guys have got to sign it off. Can you sign it off? 
right? That doesn't actually make it right. Why, why the hell are we signing that off? So by putting process in place around that, knowing that you're always going to have that sort of situation, it actually changed the conversation. People were a lot more willing to, to involve us. And we would give them tools so that they could be self-sufficient and then actually just have the right conversations at the right time. Who's familiar with this? Business Model Canvas, Lean Canvas, right? Lots of you. Who's ever used this to assess the capability of their design team? Aha. Uh -huh. Ooh, nice. Nice. Aha. Uh -huh. um, so yeah, it was actually one of the people in my team that was reading the Business Model Generation book at the time and went, hey, we should do this to ourselves. Genius idea. I loved it. Right? And that's exactly what we did. So we used this as a tool, as a way of looking at it ourselves and looking at about, well, what value do we add? And this was at the time what we came up with. Here are the core parts of the, you know, the function of the capability. And then for each of those core functional components, we said, what's the value proposition? What are the deliverables? Uh, who are the key stakeholders and who are the people that are involved? And, and what are some of the pieces of evidence or or anecdotes that support the value of that function. And so the thing was, it then became, it really shifted the conversation, and then it became a really easy exercise to go talk to stakeholders about, we need to be involved earlier in the chain. We need to be involved earlier so we can add more value. Oh, I didn't know that. We'd made all these assumptions that, well, they know what we do, right? Why aren't they involving us? <laughs> They had no idea, that's why. So, you know, whatever tool of choice, use the, a framework, use some methodology to assess your business, and don't treat it as a set and forget. It's actually one of the things that, I, as a coach, um, a lot of startups will look at the lean canvas and go, Shh, yep, done that, oh yeah, we did that, it's like, yeah, whatever. Right? So, no, it's a process. You do it again and you do, as you learn more, you then refine what's on the, so do that as a team as well. And you'll find changes in the marketplace, organisational changes. Uh, we used to do research, restructures every six months, right? <laughs> Great. So you might actually have to reassess where you fit into that. <clears throat> so now you've figured out you know, where your value is, what the functional components are. Now let's have a look at growing and enhancing that capability. Again, these are, these are ways of just stepping back and getting away from the day-to-day. -day. Um, this is an oldie but a goodie, a model that Dan Saffer did, which looked at the intersection of different types of design activity, particularly those related to UX design and interaction design. And so as a tool like this, you can use to go, oh, okay, well, what are the component parts of the capability we might need? And then in a complex environment, it might look something like this. You go back to your value chain or whichever sort of uh, mapping you've got and go, okay, well, this is probably where those functional components might sit, and we need some of that, we need some of these, and try and work out a plan. Then the next step would be to say, okay, now let's take this down to roles. I was talking then about functional components. Now let's look at it from a roles perspective. And then you can drill down and go, what about job descriptions? Oh, and what about people? Now you're starting to match skills with functional components at a higher level, a more strategic level. And if you're a smaller team, you know, you might have a subset of that, or if you're a startup, you might have a, a really well-defined, well-tuned, because you're in delivery mode. And so there's only a few roles that you need, or can afford, or whatever it might be. But you might then, as things move on a little bit, go, okay, we've done version one, we need to do version two, we need to do some of these other things, but we can't afford more people. We're going to use these people to do some of the research and some of the road mapping, not necessarily strategy. Um, and that's how we're going to define our design capability. And then you might actually say, okay, so the next step in that is we need to expand this and we need some more. This might be one person even, right? But at least you understand what the makeup is there. One of the keys to what I'm saying here is think differently about capability as to capacity. And if you actually separate those two things and think strategically about What's our current need? What's our near-term need? And what's our future need for capability? Now we've got a bit of a roadmap on that. Now we can look at how we scale that. And you might say, well, actually, usability testing, that's a really good one that we can outsource. And as we build and grow, we can put our 
afforded resources or the approved FTE into other roles, and we'll just out outsource that component. So it's about creating that roadmap and understanding. Um, by doing so, you can get confidence in who you're hiring and what, for what reason. Um, you know what the skills are that you're required. And just make sure you separate that capability and capacity. Um, so the next part of instrumental I wanted to move to is contextual limitations. And this is kind of a big one, actually. That I, I, I wanted to introduce you to Frederick Lulu, um, who I'm sure probably doesn't pronounce his name quite that, that way, but um, that's my attempt at it. And he's uh, written a book which actually discusses a history of organisations. And in his book, he discusses the history of how people work together in organisations and explores the paradigms that have emerged over the last 200 years. And this organisational history is very closely linked to the levels of prosperity at different times in history. So he assigns different colours to the different layers. And um, there's a, another chap called Peter Green, who's actually an agile and lean transformational leader in Adobe. And he's got a great little explainer video that uh, this comes from. And um, so at each level, there's these unique characteristics and breakthrough ideas. So at red, uh, it's actually typical of these days, right? It came out of survival, and that was really the construct at the time. It's based on fear and, and, and chaos, right? These days, gangs and militia groups still use this model, right? Because it's about that fear in control. At amber, or yellow, it's, it's strictly hierarchical, and it's characterised by stable, top-down leadership, strong processes. And the thing is, it's actually built to resist change. Um, and some of, the, some of the current organisations that fit in that are like traditional churches, uh, military, you know, those sort of organisations that are still needing those aspects of their organisational model. In orange, it's the metaphor of a machine. And that's typical of most large organisations today. It's still top-down, process-driven, but it's actually, but it's come out of a response to social changes after the French Revolution and the Industrial Revolution, and hence why it's largely built around a meritocracy. It's more open to change, but it's still limited by the profit motive and the hierarchical decision-making. So, particularly these days, there's this, you know, profit is number one, profit is king, and that's kind of overriding and dominating a lot within this orange model as to what's, what's going on there. And so it's, it's also why people in these organisations can often feel like they're just a cog in a machine and there's a lot of disillusionment. Um, if you uh, want to have a look at some of that too, the work that Dan Pink's done um, in the past on what really motivates people in non-task-based roles, really good videos, really good understanding of that. I think that sort of fits very much in this realm here. And currently, there's a lot of organisations that are moving to this green layer, right, the next layer off. And it's actually responding to more current social changes where people want more meaning in their work and high engagement. The focus is on culture over strategy. It's about true power for everyone in the organisation. And it has its own limitations too. You know, they still have hierarchical structures, and the consensus-building approach to things is too slow and conflicts with people's ideas of autonomy. Moving to teal, there is no hierarchy. It's a super flat structure. And in teal organisations, people act more like a living organism. If th these kind of organisations are far better equipped to handle rapid change and complexity. And Lulu actually uses an analogy of the brain. Right? So imagine the brain working as an orange organisation, and there'd be a single brain cell at the top going, right, this is what we're going to do. This is how we're going to do it. This is when we're going to do it. OK? It would not work. It, the, the enormous amount of complexity that the brain has to handle, it just doesn't work with a hierarchical based model. So you can start to understand some of the changes and need in the world that we live in today. 
Um, and remember, you know, these, these evolutions in organization have actually come out of need. Each of these layers has its own benefits and otherwise. Um, I, I guess in my experience, um, and um, uh, Mr. Green, Peter Green also talks about this as well, is green is actually largely where the agile and, and lean movements have formed. Right, so organizations moving in this green style, that's how a lot of these models have come about. And I'm putting design thinking there as well because I think it's naturally more a green association in the way that it organizes itself and the way people think about autonomy and hierarchy and those sorts of things. Um, the thing is, you quite often face, I, I, you know, I, my experience, others that have talked to me about this is a lot of organizations making this shift, they're cottoning onto and using agile and lean and those sorts of things, but their mindset's still stuck in orange. And that's where one of you get this, why can't I get cut through, right? Because they're viewing things like agile as process efficiencies, right? How can I squeeze more and get more profit? That's what we need to do, right? It might not be said quite that explicitly, but that's what we need to do. So um, this model helps explain some of these resistance points. And actually, by understanding this, we can actually try and get some greater change. Another important concept that sits around this is, uh, and Jacob Morgan actually relates to some of Lelou's work as well, there's five types of organizational structures from the classic you know, hierarchy model through to um, some of what's emerging from these sort of teal organizations, which is this holocratic structure. Um, again, has pros and cons, like each of them. And so, um, you, you know, that's a, that's a different way. Th there's actually no hierarchy here. People can do what they want. On the proviso, they actually get advice from others. You, you, and it's not consensus building. You don't have to get agreement with others. You have to get advice, and you choose what you do with that. So interesting, interesting model. Um, I've got an example here, too, of... Uh, you know, this is actually as, as my team was r under rapid growth and we were moving into Agile all at the same time and it was actually a bit uh, difficult to deal with all of that change. And so the thing was it, um, it was about if I distributed all my resources around to be uh, a distributed set of Agile teams in scrums, then I'd probably need 250 people. And I only had 100, so that wasn't going to work. So it was about centralized, decentralized model. And you know, we looked at all of these different models, uh, some of the different structural types, and uh, came up with some of this. So it's about getting the blend of what works for you and then applying that to your situation in your context. I really like this quote from Peter Drucker. The greatest danger in times of turbulence is not the turbulence. It's to act with yesterday's logic. And so if you think about these organizational models that are evolving, if we're going if we're stuck on the old ways, uh, it's probably not going to work in the future. And, and I really stress that with you know, anyone who's in a startup is try and understand and educate the people, the management structure, uh, so that you can actually take the best of some of the emerging models and not end up being stuck in, in some of the models of the past. Uh, I, I'm going to, rather than go through this, uh, it was just a sort of summary, I guess, of each of these components. So I'm going to keep moving because we're going to run out of time uh, soon. I wanted to share this as well, which uh, this originally, this maturity model came out of the US government dealing with software vendors, and they were looking at a way of how they could assess the maturity of the software vendors. Um, I, I've used it for some time and in different ways to assess design capability maturity. And... Uh, effectively, so just uh, maturity goes from bottom to top in this model and across a range of dimensions. So one, for example, being benefits, right? So if there's complete ignorance of what design capability can provide in terms of value, there's, there's no awareness of benefits. At the top level, it would be actually design is fundamental to our strategic success. It, it is enormously valuable to us. So in that way, you can sort of map where your team is, but also where you sit or where you're seen to be 
relative to the rest of the organization. And this is an example of where we did that uh, exact exercise. We identified three main groups. So all staff, key decision makers, and change agents. And then we mapped into those, where were they? Where do they need to be? What do we need to put in place? So it's not that model that I'm advocating. It's do that exercise if you want to look at how you fit, how you can add more value, and how you can get more recognition and cut through. There's a whole bunch of models out there, Forrester and Jacob Nielsen and a whole bunch of people that have got different models. Um, and, and I'm going to, you know, some of you may have seen this as well, this model of some personal competence, uh, but, but applied then to design capability. And if you look at some of the words that go with each of these levels and layers, so when you're in this unconscious competence uh, level, then you've got the right intuition about what you're doing. And your team's in the flow, right? So things are happening really nicely. So as a design leader, it's one of your roles, is how can you bring both your individual team members, but as a team, how can you move up that pyramid? One of the things that you also experience, and some of you may be experiencing right now, is what unconscious competence looks in one domain might actually be different in another domain. One of the classics, if you look at some of the um, there's research papers that look at uh, design and marketing, and it, it's actually really caught me out a number of times because, so, oh, marketing, cool. They're just like us. They're creatives. Yeah, they get us, right? And yet there's this kind of, yeah, but there's something not working here. Why are we, don't, what? Right, because the two pyramids don't quite overlap. There's actually different intent. And some of what the research papers talk about is um, the first thing an organisation does is go, right, well, we, we can't have this conflict. Uh, we need to actually harmonise here. So guess what? You harmonise and both competencies drop. Right? Because it's not about being the same. It's actually about recognising and embracing these differences getting an understanding, and sometimes you just have to go, okay, I don't get it, I don't think like that, but actually I trust that they do because they're the experts in that. So that's another part of being a leader, a design leader in particular, is leading across that gap. Um, really good piece of work from Dave Gray around liminal thinking, so th that is a really good connection with what I've just talked about, if you want to have a look uh, further into that. So have a look at the capability in terms of maturity, look at the competencies, and embrace those differences, and then try and uh, lead and manage across that. <clears throat> I'm going to skip the summary. I know I said I'd go sort of quickly here, right? Um, th this is another label to the summary. So what I've just talked about, you could think about five steps to growing design capability. Uh, in fact, I quite often get, oh, well, who should I hire? How, you know, what am I hiring for? Well, go through this, and then you'll know exactly who to hire. Um, just looking at instructional. So a couple of things here. Uh, I, I very often, and very experienced leaders, I hear interchange management and leadership. They're actually two different things. And is if, as a leader, you need to think about them as two different things and be in the two different modes. Uh, typically, as a leader, you will have to be both. But be conscious about when you need to be which. And um, I wanted to also touch on this. So as a leader, you have responsibilities, right? A responsibility is something that is your job to deal with in the right way. As a leader, you're also accountable for things. And accountability is having to answer to the actions and decisions taken to carry out the responsibilities. The thing is, you can't delegate accountability, you can delegate responsibility, right? Because if you're answering to the decisions taken, you're the one that has to answer to those. Referred banking inquiry. <laughs> you can't escape. Um, so I'm, I'm talking about this too in the sense of a leadership view on delegation. There's lots of information about delegation, particularly from a management perspective. I wanted to share, I guess, one of my learnings in, in this notion of this being something sitting around leadership. And 
I, I was getting this point, the team was scaling it. At the time, we were probably the uh, so-called two pizza size, right? Just big enough that two pizzas would go around to the team. It's a really good size of team. You're all connected. You're in the flow. Things are really great. And then it goes beyond that. And then all of a sudden, it's like, you kind of can't keep up in some sense. Pip, this team, they're really demanding. They need to, you know, they need to check in all the time. And it's like, mm. but I hire really capable people. I really trust you. Do, like, you know, I've told you what we need. What's going on here? And the thing is, um, what's missing in that equation is you're not leading, or I wasn't at the time leading. What I was doing was managing. Right? So I was doing the time-bound, measurable, you need to do these things but I wasn't providing the leadership. And what that was doing was actually setting up this, this gap because I wasn't providing the leadership, sharing enough of the vision as to the decisions that I made, are they in line with what needs to be done here the right way? And so I was exposed and they were concerned and that's why they needed to check in because they're going, well, I can make a decision. I'm pretty capable, but I'm just not... And I'm talking about you know, reasonably complex things here where there are consequences and they knew it. So that's what was making them uh, a little uncomfortable. I just want to play a, sl a slightly different um, one, but there's a little clip here from Andy Pillane, a really experienced design leader. And he's talking about here this move. My path being... from designer to design leader was, uh, I don't know if it, how usual that was, but I'd, I'd been working as a designer in a collective that called Anti Rom in the, in the 90s. And been working a lot together. I was very used to flat structures. And then when I came to Australia the, the first time and I worked for a company called Animal Logic to set up their interactive department there. Uh, and that was the, the first time I was the interactive director. It's the first time I was starting to build a team uh, underneath me. And uh, because of my experience in, in this very flat structure, it was actually incredibly uncomfortable. Um, and I, I just assumed that I'd hired lots of talented people and I just sort of let them get on with it and we were kind of working together that that would, everything would be okay. And then I realized that um, they needed some design direction. It's not like they were no good. They're just good. like every designer, you get to a point where you just need some feedback. You need to, you can't decide between things. You get too close to the work. And I realized then that I was sort of designing teams uh, when I had been designing kind of other digital, digital stuff. And that was the sort of beginnings of me moving into design leadership. I love the way Andy talks about the dip, and I was rubbish at both. <laughs> I've had that feeling. I know exactly what he's talking about. Um, so, so in instructional, uh, it's about this delegation style and managing that. Okay, well, so we've got to manage time now, right? Um, <laughs> the, so let me skip a few pieces here. I did want to be inspirational. This is my inspirational moment. <laughs> Uh, doesn't work, this is why. Inspiration actually needs to come from within the person. So it's individual, but actually work at it as a team to find what's inspirational as a team so you can build an energy. Uh, and we did lots of that and I've got some great stories on that. Um, and there's all sorts of different sources of inspiration, right? Uh, th this was inspirational to me because it actually, d this was about changing perspective. So um, nice little room here that I actually was in, took a couple of photos, this beautiful angel sitting on the coffee table. So that is where the angel was when I saw it. We had to walk up these stairs into this little room. That over there, that's still there. The room is built around it in, in situ, right? It's like, whoa. <laughs> so in whatever way, right, <laughs> exactly. Um, great installation artist, right? So there's all sorts of different ways you can find inspiration. You need to find the ones that work for you. And as a leader, there's something you're going to have to do to protect that, right? You have to work hard to protect the orange organisation coming in and ruining all of that for you. Yeah. Uh, we're going to skip over that. I'm going to tell him you did that. Yeah. Yep, sorry, John. Um, and this is one of the things that I mentioned in terms of you will be unconsciously influencing people 
some pretty horrific things in that slide there, right, is as a leader, it actually created the most horrific culture. And he ended up getting pulled from the company that he founded because the board were going, nah, not on. Because that is a really good definition of culture. Right? And do you know what? It's actually the way things get done around here when no one's watching. Right? That's culture. So if I um, sk skip to the end here, and let me just very briefly touch on um, uh, the five eyes culminate in this impact, right? The outcomes of a lot of what I've talked about, and I've had to rush through, and I've had to skip some of these, but they culminate in this impact. And as leaders, uh, we need to think about uh, we need to think about that impact. Get back to the presentation here. Um, here's a really uh, nice model. It was about 2011 or something. John C. Maxwell did this five levels of leadership, uh, and down at this level, right? You're a manager, and you're not really a leader, but people are your follower because they have to. As you move up, it's actually because they want to, or because what you've done, or what you represent. And you know, I think a lot of people are aspiring to this and wanting to be like this. It actually, as you, as you move through this, it does change. And so being aware of that is, is a really good way to think about those changes. Um, John actually talks about up to about level four. You, you can still practice that and skill yourself for that. Uh, his premise is you actually have to have natural qualities that will take you to that next level. Interesting premise. Uh, but it's a good model to think about in terms of when you're leading. And then um, I'm getting the wind up. So what I, I guess I wanted to just... Get, get you to think about how far out you want that, that impact to go and what you want to impact. And those can be difficult things because a lot of, a lot of us are thinking in that level, right? I mean, here, here's an interesting... This is, again, this societal change and the way people... what they want from the organisations they're within, what society is wanting from us as leaders, it's actually changing and we have to respond into that. So let me skip the ethics slide. <laughs> we don't need to talk about that, right? I, I, if you want, I wanted to get to this because the thing that I think is really difficult about talking of ethics, particularly in orange-like structures or yellow structures or whatever you are, or whatever the organisational model you sit within, the thing that's really difficult is, yeah... I want to be that, but what, what do I do about this? Um, Dan Arley, I don't know whether anyone saw this was a movie on SBS. Really good documentary, yeah. He's got a lot of other really good work. That um, He runs the Centre for Advanced Hindsight. Um, so that's a good one. Uh, Mary Gentile has a piece of work around giving voice to values. That is very much about... When you can spot stuff, it's like you can't, people can easily go, oh, that's not right. But how do I voice that? I'm an introvert. I don't know what to say about that. I can't go, whoa, Mr. CEO. No, you need to stop doing that, Mr. Travers. <laughs> right? It's, it's actually, um, so there's some good work in that. And a lot of you may have seen Alan Cooper talk as well about the Oppenheimer moment, to be thinking about how we can be a good ancestor. One of the other... Um, <laughs> No, Joe, Joe won't let me. I'll, I'll talk to you later. Um, one of the things that Alan talks about, this is literally the, the last slide. One of the things that Alan talks about is if we put profits as the top thing, the primary driver and the primary motivator, refer back to that orange model, it's pretty much what dominates these days, then doing the right thing, mm, it's not guaranteed. You may or may not get that. It's optional. However, if you reverse that, and put doing the right thing at the top of the tree, you can still make a crap load of money, right? So let's try and make the influence we can to get people to make these decisions and actually make the right choices. So thank you for bearing with me for my whirlwind tour of the 5 model.
Thank you very much, Ian. Um, we're over time, so questions are going to have to be down at Vessel. Um, so if everyone buys them a drink, we'll be there until Wednesday. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, thank you, Ian. No worries. Thank you. Uh, now...